I think we can um, go ahead and get started with introductions as uh, more people will start to f uh, fill in here in the next couple of minutes. Okay, that sounds great. Can people hear me? Sounds coming through great. All right. So before I introduce um, Susan, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, chair that she has held for the last three years. So the Robert Anderson Endowed Chair in Medicine uh, in HIV research was made possible by the donation of late George Anderson, uh, who was a PhD and his wife Harriet. And it is meant to provide support for HIV AIDS research and enhance the potential uh, for University of Washington AIDS researchers to make important medical discoveries. So this award supports uh, the research careers of junior and mid-career faculty members in the Department of Medicine who have demonstrated expertise um, and a commitment to HIV research and the potential to perform future research in um, AIDS and HIV that will be transformative. Professor Anderson and his wife established this endowed chair in memory of their son who died young of complications related to HIV. Dr. Anderson was a professor of oceanography at the University of Washington from 1958 until he retired in 1983 as an emeritus professor. And his research focused on oxygenation of the ocean and lakes and the impact of wastewater on lake productivity. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Susan Graham, who was awarded the first um, Anderson, Anderson Endowed Chair in Medicine for HIV research in 2017. And she actually had the great fortune of meeting Dr. George, uh, George Anderson before he died in 2019. Dr. Graham is an Associate Professor um, of Global Health and Medicine and an adjunct associate professor of epidemiology at the University of Washington. She is also the associate chair for academic programs in the Department of Global Health. Her research centers on developing effective interventions to support HIV prevention and improve HIV care outcomes in vulnerable populations, including men who have sex with men and male and female sex workers in both Kenya and the United States. Dr. Graham leads a highly collaborative uh, group um, and her work ranges from laboratory evaluations to classical clinical epidemiology to groundbreaking behavioral science. And today she will provide an overview of past and ongoing work and discuss the impact of the Robert Anderson Endowed Chair on her career. So welcome, Susan. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Wald. Um, and thank you to the um, Grand Browns organizers um, for the opportunity to present today. Um, I have my standard disclosure slide I'll do. I did uh, receive some support from Gilead and from Safiad for some of the research we'll discuss today. Um, and I just wanted to start with a big thank you for the late George Anderson, who was a professor emeritus of ocean oceanography when he uh, passed. Um, he endowed the Anderson professorship, as, as Dr. Wald said, in memory of his son, Robert. And just to reflect a little bit, um, my background and training were very much entwined with the HIV epidemic. Um, if uh, if Robert uh, had benefited from the effective preventions and treatments for HIV available today, he would have been about the same age as myself. Um, I graduated from Brown University in 1989 um, as the first antiretroviral therapy um, became available. I obtained an MPH degree from Boston University in 1990 before spending three years in Cameroon, West Africa, uh, with a focus on guinea worm eradication and water and sanitation projects, but at a time when the impact of HIV on African countries was just becoming evident. After Peace Corps, I worked at the CDC's Division of Tuberculosis Elimination for several years, helping write guidelines to address um, outbreaks of HIV-related TB in the U.S. prison system. After deciding on a medical career, I attended McGill University in Montreal, then residency training um, at the Brigham and Women's in Boston, 
Um, but during both the training uh, periods, I conducted overseas electives uh, in Cameroon um, initially and then in Botswana during residency that focused on the evolving response to the HIV epidemic in Africa. When I came to the University of Washington in 2003 as an infectious diseases fellow, the PEPFAR program, um, expanding treatment globally, um, had just made medications available in Kenya. And I had the good fortune to set up HIV um, treatment programs in two research clinics on the Kenyan coast. My uh, PhD dissertation later at the University of Toronto focused on HIV among female sex workers and solidified my focus on addressing HIV prevention and care disparities in vulnerable populations. So I'll start by um, presenting some of my work with the female sex worker population. This work was carried out in the Ganjoni Clinic in Mombasa, Kenya, uh, where in 1993, a sex worker cohort was established um, by Dr. Joan Kreis, who was a professor here at the university. Um, that cohort is now led by Scott McClelland, who was my fellowship mentor. The primary objective of the cohort was to evaluate faculty factors related to HIV transmission risk um, and devise ways to prevent uh, transmission on the African continent. Cohort enrollment was facilitated by local, the local government's uh, law requiring that uh, female sex workers get monthly STD um, screening. Um, while that screening was available um, in the local uh, government clinic for no cost, many women were attracted to the higher standard of diagnostic and treatment services that the research clinic allowed. One of my first studies was an evaluation of female genital shedding um, uh, of HIV after starting um, antiretroviral therapy. Um, we found significant decreases in the quantity of HIV-1 RNA um, by day two in blood plasma and in cervical secretions, and by day four in vaginal secretions. While detection of HIV um, DNA decreased significantly um, in vaginal secretions during the first week, 10 women still had um, genital secre secretions that had detectable RNA or DNA at day 28. We followed this cohort longitudinally with monthly uh, visits and swabs for uh, cervical and vaginal uh, secretions. Uh, to evaluate correlates of HIV shedding over time after treatment initiation, including the influence of baseline CD4 count, ART adherence, and hormonal contraceptive use. In that study, we found that cervical HIV shedding six months after ART initiation was higher with the concurrent use of Depo-Provera, uh, the injectable contraceptive, and for women who had a baseline CD4 count that was less than 100. In both vaginal and cervical secretions, shedding was higher in women with lower self-reported adherence. And it became clear that adherence was critical for genital HIV suppression, just as it was for plasma, and that drug resistance could develop in genital tract secretions separately from plasma. I did a detailed study of women who developed treatment failure, which at that time could only be diagnosed using clinical or immunologic uh, criteria, such as a drop in the CD4 count. We found that women had accumulated resistance mutations, a median of two and a half years in plasma, and for a median of 1.7 years in genital secretions before we were finally able to diagnose their treatment uh, failure. And these findings help provide evidence for the eventual switch from CD4 count to viral load monitoring in resource limited settings. In my dissertation work, I evaluated how HIV had impacted sexual risk behavior in what we now call the Mombasa cohort of female sex workers over its 15 years and kind of up until the time when antiretroviral treatment became available. We found in adjusted analysis that reporting never using condoms did decrease significantly over time at enrollment visits, but there was no difference in partner numbers among the women who enrolled um, into the cohort at the time that they were just joining, uh, reflecting the dependence of these women on sex work for their livelihood. 
once women were in the cohort, inconsistent condom use became less common over their follow-up visits, and partner numbers actually did decrease over time, reflecting a move towards risk reduction and self-protection, especially in the years before ART became available. Now I'm going to transition to my work uh, with gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Um, and tell you how that happened. Um, I refer to this group as MSM throughout, but it's important to keep in mind that they're a heterogeneous group with, uh, with uh, different uh, identifications. And in fact, in our early work, we included transgender women inadvertently in this group because they were not yet really uh, identified as a research group um, for us there. So globally, um, we refer to key populations as, um, as the groups that are most vulnerable to HIV. Um, it became apparent earlier in the HIV epidemic that uh, for reasons both biologic and um, related to structural stigma and discrimination, that female sex workers, men who have sex with men, and persons who inject drugs are at higher risk for HIV. Yet in Africa, the HIV pandemic, uh, when, when it was recognized, was um, shown to have spread to the general population. And this led to an appropriate emphasis on broad programs reaching individuals in the general population. But unfortunately, uh, targeted programs for more vulnerable groups, such as female sex workers, were largely neglected. And the idea that there was injection drug use or male-male sex um, contributing to the epidemic there was actually barely considered. There was very little work in this area. That all started to change in uh, around 2004 when a research group based in Senegal published the first report of HIV amongst MSM living in Dakar. Their study participants had an HIV prevalence of 21.5% and a syphilis prevalence of 4.8%, both much high, higher than in um, general population men. Um, of note, the vast majority of their uh, male participants also had female partners. Within four years of the Senegalese paper's publication, multiple studies had been published from African countries showing that um, not only did um, MSM exist in those countries, but they had a high HIV prevalence, sometimes uh, much higher than the general population. In 2006, I was part of a group that undertook a capture recapture survey on the Kenyan coast to identify MSM sex workers at hot spots, including bars, nightclubs, beach areas, private brothels, and street areas or parks. Using a methodology that is similar to capture release tagging in wildlife surveys, we estimated a total population of over 700 um, MSM selling sex in the Mombasa area alone. And these became, um, uh, this became a target population for our research. At the time I had started a collaboration with Dr. Edward Sanders um, uh, of the Kemri Medical Research Institute and International AIDS Vaccine Initiative to establish parallel cohorts of HIV positive and HIV negative adults at a high risk um, uh, at high risk for HIV in uh, Matwapa, a town just north of Mombasa. Um, at this clinic, we had uh, participants come and undergo regular visits with risk reduction counseling, STI screening, free condoms, and HIV testing if they were seronegative. I led the HIV positive cohort um, for individuals who uh, were followed for, while they received HIV treatment and care. Uh, working with the MSM participants um, was quite interesting. Um, we um, started recruitment um, by having a drop-in center um, with peer educators who were trained on STD symptoms and trained on the importance of HIV testing. They went out to the hot spots of the, of the type that we identified in the other study. And we worked with a community advisory board. Um, we uh, tried to link men to uh, local NGOs and legal services for their needs that were not medically related. Working with this group, um, 
we, we realized that th there really had been a lag in including them in HIV prevention um, efforts. Um, the, the MSM uh, we worked with that had very poor recognition that anal sex was risky. They had mostly been hearing about HIV in women, which was higher. The prevalence is, has, has usually been higher in, among women than in men in Africa. And so they thought that HIV was a vaginal disease. And we still have men coming and saying this um, to us. Um, they, uh, there were very high levels of stigma related to same-sex behavior in this population. And so the men had problems accessing tailored information, uh, problems um, getting into care, um, adhering to, to treatment, re uh, being retained in care. And that um, the stigma that was related to their same-sex behavior was compounded for the HIV-positive men, of course. So very challenging situation. We um, conducted several studies as we started to work with this population and were among the first groups to publish on, um, on incidents, which is coming up. The prevalence in our uh, population um, among men who had sex with only male partners was very high at 43%. So similar to what we were finding in the female sex workers, these men generally had a more receptive uh, role in anal sex. Um, the prevalence was about 12% amongst men who had both male and female partners, and many of those men took the more insertive uh, role or were less frequently receptive. Uh, prevalent HIV infection in the, in the group was associated with unprotected receptive anal intercourse and increasing age, not surprisingly. Um, we had initially a lot, some pushback from local um, sort of Kenyan, more government folks um, about uh, whether or not this was really a Kenyan phenomena. So we actually spent time to document um, using a diary study who uh, the partners were of the male sex workers and found that most of the partners were Kenyan um, and that, that quite a few of them did have female partners. And we um, actually uh, worked with the uh, U.S. Army uh, to uh, sequence circulating strains uh, in the men who had who acquired HIV infection, um, and we found that the um, strains that that were um, that they were acquiring were um, of the subtypes that were common in Kenya, so subtype A and D, very occasionally C. Um, and not B, which is the subtype found in North America and Europe more frequently. Um, and we also found dual infections and recombinants to be um, common, and that's likely related to the very high incidence um, that we found. So 5.8 per 100 person years um, in the men who had sex with men, um, men and women, and up to 35.2 per 100 person years among those men who were um, uh, exclusively receptive, many of whom identified as gay, and, and it turned out many um, eventually identified as transgender women. So very high incidence. And um, before uh, we had the av availability of the ART, and as we got people on treatment, um, the pretreatment viral loads persisted at a very high level, higher than expected given um, normal set points. Um, and we believe that that was likely due to reinfections that were occurring in this population. We found that work setting up programs uh, was very challenging because a lot of the counselors and healthcare providers in Kenya um, were not we're not trained to be sensitive uh, uh, to um, sexual minority individuals. They've had very little um, little content in their training that, that related to anything that they could use. Um, and uh, homophobic attitudes were very, very common. Um, a lot of the counselors especially had a sort of a religious background and um, we initially found a lot of them working to um, try and convert um, the MSM to um, be, be heterosexual. Um, it was really challenging. So we, we developed a curriculum and, um, in collaboration with the group in South Africa that felt uh, faced the same um, kinds of issues. And that, that uh, training was effective at reducing homophobia, but this is still an ongoing need. Antiretroviral adherence became something I was um, really um, 
concerned about um, for the MSM population. In the cohorts there at the Kemery Clinic, we found that um, men in general had uh, sort of disparities um, compared to women when they joined the cohort. They were less, um, they less frequently had disclosed to anyone had ever had ART counseling or had ever started treatment. And then when we had followed up the uh, men had sex with men um, participants, although they were retained in the cohort and they really um, enjoyed our services and were an active group, their adherence to treatment was actually uh, much worse um, than that, especially amongst the female sex workers. Um, and they had uh, correspondingly lower weight gain and lower CD4 uh, gains after treatment. So um, we, we became concerned that they needed something else in order to, um, to be able to um, benefit from their treatments. Um, uh, other work um, in the rest of Kenya has borne this out um, and still there are disparities um, with the prevalence estimated nationally at 18.2% um, versus 5.5% in general population males. Um, and the care cascade um, for those who are living with HIV is very different. So in general population males, 73% of those living with HIV were aware of their status. 94% of those who were aware of their status were taking treatment. And of those on treatment, 91% of those um, on treatment were undetectable. The corresponding estimates for the MSM were only 56, 61, and 82%. So there are still significant disparities. Um, and, you know, related to stigma and a number of things we'll discuss, um, I really became uh, interested in, in working to uh, develop an intervention. And so I joined forces with Dr. Jane Simone, a psychologist um, here at the University of Washington, um, and my um, colleagues at Kemri to, um, to uh, put together an R34 application to the NIH that was successfully funded. Um, it was called Shikamana, um, at, which means stick together uh, in Kiswa. Healy, uh, that it was a provider and peer support intervention to improve ART adherence amongst Kenyan a, um, MSM. And um, we basically went through a series of steps that R34 grants tend to do, in which first you conduct qualitative research to really understand what is behind this disparity, what is going on that, um, that really is leading to these poor outcomes. Then you take that information as well as, um, as evidence-based in interventions that are out there and kind of put it together and tailor it to the, uh, the population you're targeting. And generally, um, and the last stage of an R34 is to do a small trial to look at feasibility, acceptability, um, safety, and the initial sort of effect size on your outcome of interest. We did a uh, qualitative, we published our qualitative work on that study um, and found multiple um, sort of uh, barriers uh, as well as some facilitators to ART adherence in the MSM population. Um, you know, certainly uh, uh, trust in providers, uh, community stigma, the whole criminalization with people sometimes ending up being thrown in jail. Um, you know, uh, a number of uh, limitations to their HIV knowledge that, that uh, went along with this general lack of tailored information for them. And yet at the same time, we did find some men who were doing very well, who were coping, who sort of had the resilience and skills um, in order to really um, uh, be successful. And so when we um, developed our intervention, uh, we decided to combine two different um, uh, sort of methods. One was motivational interviewing by the providers at the clinic, especially the counselors. Um, and and I, I know many of you know about motivational interviewing for smoking cessation and other types of interventions. Um, we used a particular uh, approach called next step counseling, which had been used in the IPREX trial, which was the big international trial of PrEP. 
um, developed by Rive Amico, and it really is designed to increase motivation and specific skills related to pill taking by having um, folks think about um, what is this, what is the main barrier for themselves that they might be able to change. What would be the next step that they could do to move forward in terms of carrying pills with them or disclosing to the person who is the obstacle um, because they're afraid of, of disclosure. Um, or, or just you know, taking specific steps. So our counselors focused on that. And then we also thought that peer support was really important because of the resilience that we identified. Um, there were some men who really had figured, some, figured this out and were able to help other men by, by sharing their experiences. Um, they really helped increase knowledge because by bringing the knowledge to the level and, and, and in way using words that the community used, they were able to increase motivation and um, increase that resilience that would help men to um, overcome the obstacles they all faced. Um, we, let's see, there we go. Uh, we next conducted a randomized trial um, with 60 participants who um, 30 assigned to the intervention and 30 to standard care, which was just generally uh, uh, adherence counseling as had normally been done um, in the clinic based on Kenyan training. Um, and we, we looked at the feasibility of this, the acceptability and the safety um, for participants, um, for the study staff who face sometimes secondary uh, stigma from being associated with a project um, uh, that was focused on helping sexual minority individuals. And for our peers who we called washikaji, which means sort of buddies or they, they stick together um, because the uh, peers were, also living with HIV and disclosed to the participants. And so we wanted to make sure they were uh, safe. So that um, trial has been published. We found um, fairly good retention. This is a hard uh, population to work with. So 85% in each arms. The next step counseling became something our counselors realized was more was was working better than the usual counseling because it was more tailored. It involved the part um, the patient in a sort of participatory exchange, and was less didactic than the uh, usual counseling. Um, our peer component was very uh, successful. We did have three participants who decided they didn't want to peer and who were just really too. Um, too nervous to engage with a peer, but there were 24 successful pairings, very high acceptability, very good feedback. Um, and some of those um, peers continued to support each other after the trial. Um, and notably, we had no adverse events um, related to the disclosure um, between the peers and the participants. Um, and encouragingly, um, the, um, the intervention did seem to help. Um, in these uh, two graphs, the, um, the dotted line or the dashed line is the, um, is the intervention. Um, and generally, um, self-reported adherence was higher um, amongst um, the intervention group. And we did have, um, at month three, a statistically significant um, difference in viral suppression. Um, that was really uh, a, much of it due to the ART naive folks really um, achieving viral suppression more quickly. And there was this overall a six-fold increased odds of viral suppression at month three or six in the intervention group. So we really think that this is a promising intervention and are, are um, disseminating our results on this, um, uh, especially because uh, we think it would work well in other settings um, where patient-centered care and this motivational approach and peer approach would really, really help um, in settings where uh, providers are not always equipped to help these groups. Um, I also worked in Kisimu, which is one of the largest um, studies. It's the third largest study in Kenya. There's Nairobi, then Mombasa, then Kisimu. Um, we had a um, demonstration project there that was funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, it's PI'd by a Kenyan PI, Fred Otieno, and I worked with colleagues from the University of Illinois at Chicago on this project. We had a cohort of 700 men who had sex with men in that, um, in that town. Um, we enrolled them into a sort of a demonstration package of 
uh, interventions that were aimed to link um, men to care, retain them in care. This was before PrEP was available. So it was mostly care and treatment with uh, condoms, lubricant and risk reduction counseling for the HIV negative men. Uh, we did later uh, receive some funding to um, have a small cohort for PrEP. So once the um, one year follow up in the original um, study was completed. We had a small cohort of 120 uh, men who um, were followed over 12 uh, months on PrEP. Um, so that enabled us to do some work. Actually, that included uh, um, sites in Nairobi, sites in Kisumu, and on the coast um, for our MSM work. Um, in that uh, study, we had 89% of our men were HIV negative. Um, we uh, had fairly good retention. Again, 80% is pretty good for, for men who, who include sex uh, workers. A little lower uh, uh, incidence at 2.3 cases. Um, and again, the HIV uh, risk was increased with receptive or versatile sexual and condomless um, receptive anal intercourse. There was great interest in PrEP and we were very excited. It seemed that people would really um, take this up. But our initial PrEP adherence um, was actually very disappointing. Um, despite counseling and uh, sort of support to folks using a motivational interviewing type of approach, we found that only 13.7% of our cohort participants who had dried blood spots that we could test actually had protective levels at the visits where they, um, they were tested. So that is our next challenge. Um, and uh, certainly treatment and prevention are dif different. Uh, you know, taking a pill to prevent uh, HIV is a lot different. And we recognize that basically, you know, for treating yourself and for avoiding dying of AIDS or getting complications, that is a different mindset. For taking prevention, um, due to the stigma of HIV and having those pills around, this was really complicated. So went back to the drawing board for another R34 application to the NIH. Um, this was going to be Shikamana PrEP. So our version of, uh, of the intervention for PrEP. And we decided that really for this, the important thing was to have a com community participatory approach where we really asked um, the community what they wanted, what they thought about PrEP, what were the barriers and facilitators, why was this happening? Um, I am uh, collaborating with uh, co-PI uh, Gary Harper from the University of Michigan. He is a psychologist who um, is gay himself, has done a lot of work on healthy sexuality development. And so we decided to take a sexual health approach. Uh, we worked with his colleague. Um, we're working with uh, Rive Ameko, who is the, um, the person who did the next step counseling for the IPREX trial and is uh, really wonderful at uh, counseling interventions. And we are now in year, uh, just finishing year, three, year two of our um, prep support intervention where again, we're taking this, the, the, these R34s from mental health, you do a qualitative work, followed by adaptation of the intervention, um, and then the small trial. And we're about to start our small trial of PrEP. Um, and just to share a little bit about that, so these are the three steps. Uh, we really took a community-based approach. The community designed our logo for the project. Uh, the photo below has our intervention team. We have young men who volunteered to be trained as interviewers and did the qualitative research uh, with us. Um, uh, they, they also became the intervention team and they're going to be delivering the intervention. So they've all been trained in next step counseling. So, you know, in contrast to the uh, treatment adherence um, intervention where we used providers and counselors who weren't gay um, to deliver the intervention, in this uh, PrEP intervention, we are using community members. And that's, I think, been very important. And we hope to see a difference. Um, as an example of where we ended up with a, our PrEP intervention approach, um, we had a big community meeting, learned all sorts of myths and, and problems that the community um, had with uh, the way PrEP had been rolled out without involving them very much. Uh, their, uh, the intervention development team, as I mentioned, were these young men from the community. 
And our final modules cover sexual health basics, such as HIV and STDs, but also stress and coping, healthy relationships and communication and relationships, and healthy sexuality and empowerment. Um, each of these modules is delivered with a motivational interviewing component to sort of think about a next step that people could take to improve relationships, to improve the way they cope with stress, um, et cetera. Um, and so we're really looking forward to this training as uh, next week, actually, uh, as sort of a, a refresher training before our trial and uh, the, the community's gearing up. We will be, um, uh, sorry, we will be testing um, uh, dry blood spots as well and, and urine prep levels in that trial to see if we make a difference in prep. But we also are looking at a number of mental health and um, resilience and coping outcomes um, to, to address, to look at mechanisms that um, hopefully will impact um, PrEP adherence. I do want to say that, uh, something about mental health and substance use for this population. It's really astounding, um, just the amount of stigma, the lack of support that they tend to have, very high prevalence. Um, we did a, a very large study of uh, 1476 uh, men at, at three different sites, Nairobi, Kisimu, and Mombasa, and 31% um, had moderate to severe depressive symptoms and 44% had harmful alcohol use with an audit of eight or higher. Um, the sexual and HIV stigma levels are fairly high and correlated with those depressive symptoms and alcohol use. Transactional sex is common. A lot of them got kicked out of school at an early age or have faced various problems with work. Childhood abuse uh, reported by our participants is, is shockingly high, and this is just physical or, or um, sexual violence. And, uh, and up to 51% of our, our population have report um, some sort of abuse in the past 12 months, either intimate partner violence, rape or beatings, sometimes by police. Um, uh, not surprisingly, depressive symptoms are associated with this type of abuse. And so really mental health and substance use interventions are really needed and, and are an area that I'm, I'm working to pursue. Um, just to say, you know, this, this really, the homophobia and the hate crimes are, um, are, you know, just a serious problem for folks here. It's, it's getting better, but um, there's just a lot of, um, a lot of work that's being done and the community is helping to address a lot of these challenges. Um, advocacy is really important. Um, there are sexual orientation laws that sort of uh, penalize people who have same-sex activities. In Kenya, uh, two of the LGBT organizations did try and appeal to the Supreme Court um, so, um, so the laws against sodomy and just uh, despite a very, very important effort, they, they, um, that law was not changed, unfortunately, um, but they, they continue their efforts and so need that kind of support. So I'm going to move next to um, some work that I've done on improving HIV testing and care outcomes um, and just sort of give you a flavor of that. This is um, work that was done for an R01, I think my first R01 actually, uh, called Tambua Mapema Plus. And Tambua Mapema is to discover early. And we were looking at how you could possibly um, try and identify um, people very, very early as they, you know, in acute infection, ideally, um, in order to really try and interrupt transmission. And this was after our work with female sex workers, MSM, and even some general population couples um, that, that uh, really showed these people tended to get symptoms. So we had done some work um, showing that, um, that, uh, People in Kenya who acquire HIV often acquire, have symptoms, go and seek care, are not tested for HIV or counseled about HIV, but generally get tested for malaria. So we put together this R01 application um, that had the following aims. We were going to test uh, 1,500 adults um, who, who met a sort of a acute HIV screening algorithm, which I'll show you. Um, so basically it's symptoms of acute infectious illness. And we wanted to, to screen them for um, both uh, acute and prevalent HIV. So we started with RNA testing. 
and then link those uh, persons who were diagnosed to immediate treatment so that they could, um, th that their transmission risk would, would then quickly be um, abrogated. Um, we also then did assisted partner notification services to all of the cases. We offered that and screened the partners as well using an RNA um, test to look for acute and prevalent HIV in partners and identify local transmission clusters. Um, and then we worked with some modelers led by Steve Goudreau um, here at the University of Washington um, and uh, Devin Hamilton at the CSDE uh, to look at what would the impact of this work be done if you brought it to scale um, in terms of HIV infections averted. And we worked with uh, Joseph Baba Gumura, who was a cost effectiveness analyst here at, at the U um, to, to look at the cost effectiveness of that intervention. Um, so, and as background, HIV testing is really the key gateway to, um, to the care cascade and to getting treatment or prevention appropriately. Um, as I mentioned, this is not really happening for um, testing for acute HIV is not happening in African settings. We do it sometimes in our emergency rooms and such. The risk score algorithm that we did use um, to identify persons more likely to have HIV um, gave a point to the younger individuals, 18 to 29, because they had a higher incidence than some other groups. And then one point for fever, fatigue, body pains, diarrhea, and sore throat. So one point each for those and three points for genital ulcer disease, which uh, was, was pretty heavily associated with acute HIV um, in this type of population. And what we did was to enroll persons um, Sorry, uh, we enrolled persons with a, a score of two or higher on this risk score um, into our study. Um, a little more background, um, HIV RNA testing um, is something that has not been very widely available, but is actually becoming more available in resource limited settings uh, due to um, the spread of these uh, Cepheids expert machines, which are being used for tuberculosis diagnosis, but also for diagnosis of early infant um, HIV um, during the period before antibodies develop in the, um, during the period when antibodies don't tell you whether the, infection, uh, the infant is infected or not. So, um, and also as viral load testing becomes more available in developing countries, um, there are more of these machines. So we said, well, this is proof of concept. We should be able to use these uh, same tests to diagnose acute HIV. And we've published a, um, a systematic review that summarized some of these. Um, the ones that we used are that one of the first ones, the expert HIV qual is the one we, uh, the test we use to diagnose acute HIV. And basically if you have over a thousand copies of HIV, which if you're, sa you, you're saying you don't have HIV, you're not on treatment, you should have. Um, these are the folks we were diagnosing. So in the Tambua Mapema Plus trial, which ended about a year ago, um, we enrolled part, uh, patients aged 18 to 39 with a risk score of two or more and no previous HIV diagnosis. We used a stepped wedge design where basically first we just observed standard care um, in those health in six different health facilities where our study took place. Um, and we, we just, we observed how many people got tested for HIV and how many were treated. In our intervention period, we tested everyone using the RNA and we wanted to see how many new HIV diagnoses would happen in each study period. So in, in terms of the trial results, we actually, it turns out that there, that HIV incidence may be decreasing a bit in the study area. So we were a little disappointed in the number of cases, but um, we did diagnose uh, uh, 37 patients in the intervention versus 13 in the observation period um, when there was lower testing and the tests were only for antibodies. Of the 37 new cases in the intervention period, two had acute HIV. Um, most, almost all of our patients newly diagnosed in the intervention started ART within a week, some with, most within 48 hours. Um, and so the intervention itself 
um, where basically it was opt out. You had to have an RNA test if you, unless you, unless you refused. Um, it uh, it did result in a twofold greater odds of being diagnosed with HIV. So not unexpected. If you test more people and you test with a more sensitive test, you will capture more infections. But what are the implications? And this is what we're working on currently in terms of the modeling results. So uh, provider in initiated uh, testing, which was the standard care um, at the current rate in the study was about 26%. And that's very similar to what is seen in, um, in, in these um, in resource limited settings. Providers are busy, they don't get it done. Um, with that approach, you can diagnose about 90% of people living with HIV in the model. When you take the um, RNA testing approach, you can capture 97.5% of people living with HIV. So much better and actually you know, exceeding the target of 95, 95, 95, which UNAIDS has. If you only scale up testing, so you pretty much test everyone. We, we did not, almost 95% of those targeted were tested when, um, with the opt-out approach. You can only get to 94.4 because there are some people who don't have antibodies yet. So your rapid tests will not capture everyone. And in the figures on the right of this slide, you can see that um, that there is you know, a small step for everyone that you um, cover with the intervention and for every increase with the RNA, you are getting closer to knowing who has HIV and getting those people on treatment. So the intervention averted 9.4% of infections in the 10-year simulation. Um, scaling up uh, rapid tests where you're only looking at antibodies, in contrast, only um, averted 1% of infections. So the model seems to tell us that this RNA testing is doing something important with respect to treatment as prevention and basically getting everyone on treatment and getting them um, suppressed as soon as possible. Uh, cost effectiveness results, we have preliminary results and are writing up our papers, but well, interestingly, um, the, uh, because of the prevention um, effect that, that I just mentioned, the, um, the intervention is actually cost effective um, when you take into account the cost of lifetime ART for all of the people who get infected um, when you just use rapid tests. So this will be an interesting publication to get out because right now there's concern that testing is very expensive and that the yield of testing is going down. Yet our, our uh, work is showing that um, basically um, decreasing the frequency or amount of HIV testing is penny wise, but pound foolish, and not really something that's going to result in um, improved control of the epidemic. So that's that work um, ongoing. Future directions uh, are sort of related to other grants I got. I would say the Anderson Award helped uh, with, uh, with sort of grants and time for writing because um, I got busy right before COVID in terms of projects. Um, one, one ongoing project is on HIV and COVID. Um, we are looking at the Madison Clinic. This was done with the CIFAR, CIFAR uh, Behavioral Science Corps on which I'm, um, I'm one of the, I'm an assistant director um, for that core with Dr. Simone um, and some colleagues. And we have surveyed 400 patients at the Madison Clinic about how COVID social distancing impacted um, their uh, mental health, their substance use, their sexual health in terms of STIs and condomless sex. And um, we're going to be looking at the impact also on viral load suppression in that um, clinic. So we're really interested in sort of in mental health and HIV treatment adherence. Um, in fact, there is a new center that recently was funded that Dr. Simone and um, Dr. Pamela Collins are PIing. That is, a, it, I think the notice is on its way <laughs> to the UW uh, for an HIV mental health center. So that will be future work. Another area that I've, I'm working in involves social frailty in older women. I'm interested in, in these are the female sex workers back in Mombasa who now have aged just as I have. 
Um, and I am working with uh, Scott McClellan, Jane Simone, and uh, Wayne McCormick in geriatrics to do a study looking at um, women living with HIV and those without HIV, um, 40 years and older, and really look at, at you know, what is their social support? How can, how can they stay on treatment? How can they achieve good outcomes and, and you know, maintain health in older age? in a place where there's not a lot of support, there's not a case management, et cetera. So um, we're doing, uh, we're using a social vulnerability index that's been associated with mortality and, um, and cognitive decline in um, several studies um, in Canada and Europe. We are also looking at social networks to see if the social networks and the support available to HIV positive women differ from those for HIV negative women. We'll look at clinical frailty, disability and viral load ad adherence in the HIV positive group. So that is a, a new direction that I hope to build upon. Another uh, new study is an R01 that um, I, uh, I got with Jane Simone um, and we're working with a couple of health economists from the Choice Institute at UW. So Brett Hauber, Hauber, who's now primarily at Pfizer, but working with us and Doug Barthold. We're doing a study about the long acting ART that's becoming available. So for treatment of HIV, there will be um, these injectable or even potentially implants, um, different kinds of uh, new technologies. And what we're doing is using a discrete choice experiment, which asks patients to choose between different hypothetical um, uh, products. And so would you take a, an implant that had to go in and once a year versus a subcutaneous injection that was weekly, but you could do at home versus your current oral um, ART daily, daily pill. Um, we are, we've done uh, pilot testing in the United States and we are just about to start the full DCE here in um, Seattle, as well as at a site at Emory in Atlanta. And we'll conduct that full experiment by the end of this year, after which we'll move to Kenya and actually do some um, pilot testing of a similar DCE in, uh, DCE instrument that will develop, um, will adapt for the Kenyans context and see what, uh, what uh, patients in a, a resource limited setting think about different uh, ways of getting potentially HIV treatment. So in conclusion, um, there's been a lot of progress made in HIV diagnosis, prevention and treatment um, that uh, unfortunately those in the early years did not benefit from. My contributions have hopefully helped uh, improve outcomes for vulnerable populations in Kenya and, and some of my studies in the US. Um, and the support from the Anderson chair was uh, really important for my career process uh, progress. It really helped me get time for grant writing and thinking. Uh, helping vulnerable and marginalized populations achieve better outcomes is complicated, but awarding, uh, rewarding. And I, I, I'll put a plug for interdisciplinary collaborations with uh, behavioral scientists, mental health, addiction, medicine specialists, modelers, health economists. The, um, some working in these teams is a really great way to learn a lot yourself and to um, sort of move things forward in terms of policies and, and, and treatment approaches. So with that, I'm going to acknowledge my many, many, many collaborators um, in uh, multiple places. Um, and I am happy to take uh, questions. Thank you so much for that excellent talk, summarizing such a great deal of work, both abroad and here. Um, one of the questions that came up in the chat was, you know, a lot of times we think about taking our practices and then tr uh, transferring them uh, to the developing world. How has your research in Kenya sort of impacted how you think about care of vulnerable populations here at home? Yeah, thanks. That's, a, that's an excellent question. I think um, one of the things uh, it really has shown is just... Um, it's a, in a setting where you don't have a lot of resources and where patients don't have access, you um, think about different ways that the, either by helping the, at the individual, the interpersonal like provider to patient or um, kind of community, even family members sort of uh, enlisting the people around the patient um, is, is, is important and 
you know, probably more cost effective in some ways than using um, sort of care models that are like the medical home, which is wonderful, but it takes a lot of resources. Um, I myself have a HIV clinic down in Olympia. Um, that's, that's where I see my patients. It's outside of Madison and it doesn't have all of the various caseworkers, psychologists, diabetes people. Um, and I, I've seen that there, you know, folks in rural areas have similar um, situations to some of my patients in Kenya in terms of resources. So I think, I think it really does highlight the very, you know, the big barriers that folks, um, face and really make you be creative about <laughs> what could be done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other questions in the chat? So we have a couple minutes left here. I, I thought it was a wonderful talk. I don't have any other clarifying questions to ask. Um, and I think we'll give folks a few more minutes in case any questions come up. Um, but otherwise, thank you for for all the work you're doing and the wonderful talk. And um, I think we're okay to end a, a couple minutes early. <laughs> oh, it's always good to do that. If we Especially on such a beautiful day on a Friday. Um, a, a couple thank yous coming in. And, and I agree. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. And, um, and we're so happy to have you here uh, to share with us. Great. Well, thank you all. It was a pleasure. And um, yeah. I'm happy to talk. If anyone wants to connect outside of this uh, forum, I'm I'm available uh, at you know G R A H A M S M at uw.edu. Thanks so much. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a great Friday. Great. Thank you.